start. Okay, so welcome uh, everyone to, uh, to 2022. Uh, 2021 uh, has been uh, has been a very uh, a very interesting year. Um, we are changing some things up, uh, as well as our annual uh, central bank uh, modeling uh, conference. Uh, so we started these uh, FPAS forecasting and policy analysis system uh, conferences. Uh, in 1998 uh, in the Reserve Bank of New Zealand. Uh, and interestingly enough, uh, the title of the very first uh, conference where they uh, unveiled uh, the, for the very first forecasting and policy analysis system uh, to support flexible inflation targeting, okay, it was called Monetary Policy Under Uncertainty. Uh, and so next year, uh, in Colombia, uh, we will have the 25th uh, anniversary, and it will be about monetary policy under uh, uncertainty. Uh, and so we'll be talking a little bit about that here. Uh, David Archer uh, from the BIS uh, has been, uh, uh, I would say, uh, inspiring us uh, to think about uh, ways that we can improve uh, uh, the first generation of forecasting and policy analysis systems, uh, what we are going to refer to here as the FPAS Mark I. So the systems that were developed uh, in places like uh, initially in the Bank of Canada, then the Reserve Bank of New Zealand, and then countries like uh, the Czech Republic and Chile, uh, all central banks that uh, one would want to associate if we're talking about developing uh, state-of-the-art uh, forward-looking uh, monetary policy uh, frameworks. Uh, and, and so David uh, uh, suggested uh, that we change these seminar uh, series a little bit uh, to have something uh, where we could get offer uh, sort of practical uh, advice, which uh, people might, you know, issues that people might be uh, struggling with. Okay, now, now obviously we, uh, we help people uh, struggle with those issues <laughs> uh, through courses and so on. But, but uh, in some cases, uh, it's just a question of kind of uh, pointing people in the direction uh, of ways that people are solving problems that they're, uh, that they're facing. Right now, obviously, uh, stagflationary uh, types of shocks, okay? Uh, where even some of the most seasoned uh, central banks uh, are are being uh, are are going to be tested, or either being tested now, or or probably are going to be tested over the next uh, year or so. So uh, David uh, was basically a co-author on multiple presentations over the last uh, few months, uh, and the idea is to carry on. So I'll be touching on uh, some of the subjects or topics of FPAS Mark uh, two, but this will be very much a, a continuous process <laughs> over the next uh, year. I can flesh out uh, uh, some of these issues in uh, detail and so on. So Jose, uh, who's from the uh, Central Bank of Colombia. Colombia has taken on the, the annual uh, workshop and so I'm going to ask him uh, to say a few words about uh, how it's being organized this year, uh, as, uh, as well as what the topics are and, and so on. And then the other thing uh, is the organization of the seminars. Um, so now we have a, a bit of a committee of central bankers uh, that are interested in uh, participating and collaborating in terms of uh, the types of topics that we're interested in and papers that we're interested in uh, seeing presented. And so we have Shelva uh, from the uh, Central Bank of Georgia, uh, who is gonna be acting as the, the coordinator. So he'll, he will say a few words about, uh, about what the seminar series will, uh, will be like, but let's start with, uh, with, with maybe Jose uh, to talk about the, the modeling workshop. Thank you very much. Um, well, happy New Year to everybody. 
Well, we're really happy that the Bank of la Republica, the Central Bank of Colombia, will be hosting the 25th Central um, Bank Macroeconomic Modeling Workshop. The, the information um, for the workshop is not out yet. We're expecting to, to release it at, at some point in early February. But it's, this is a nice opportunity to, to talk to you a, li a little bit about the, the, the plans that we have if, uh, for this. Um, well, it, it is really nice because, well, this is the, the 25th uh, Central Bank Microeconomic uh, Modeling Workshop. And as, as Doc mentioned, it uh, is going to be a center on monetary policy under uncertainty uh, revisited, uh, reminding the first seminar uh, or the first workshop that was held 25 years ago. Uh, the idea is to receive um, research that is focused on and the forecasting and, and policy analysis system. That is the main idea of the, of the kind of research that will be interesting in, in, in this uh, workshop. And we are keeping uh, the topics um, or, or having a, a, a wide array of, of topics uh, uh, for this workshop, considering that the idea is to incorporate uh, these ideas of uncertainty and also of research that is relevant for the um, for the forecasting and policy analysis system, as I mentioned before. Uh, the topics that we will be or we're planning to cover is uncertainty in macroeconomic policy analysis, policy implications of heterogeneity in macroeconomic models, also a uh, macroeconomic uh, policy and capacity constraints, uncertainty about a uh, bar variables which actually is something that, for example, here in, in Colombia, and I'm pretty sure that in other emerging markets has been um, creating a lot of debate inside the central bank teams with all the changes that we have seen recently. And also uh, endogenous country risk premium, which is really interesting given what we have seen with the uh, increases in, in public debt, uh, climate change and macroeconomic modeling, uh, new monetary policy frameworks, um, and the analytical frameworks that support price and financial stability objectives, eh, among others. Eh, we're as I mentioned before, we're planning to, to release information on, on the workshop on, on February. And the dates that the workshop is going to be held is November 9, 10, and 11 of, of, of this year. So, so I'd just like to say that uh, uh, COVID hasn't been all bad. Uh, 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 one of the great things for the workshop uh, by moving to Zoom, uh, for example, uh, is that we've attracted some of the best uh, papers. Uh, last year, for example, uh, we had 100 presentations uh, when it was hosted by the Central Bank of Chile, uh, uh, you know, led by for example, Brudemeyer's work on uncertainty and bubbles and stuff like that, as well as very practical uh, applications uh, by central bank uh, economists on far-ranging uh, topics. Uh, the other thing uh, that I find interesting uh, uh, for doing uh, technical assistance uh, with central banks uh, for years, uh, when COVID hit, I always thought, uh, what would it be like uh, if you never actually met a person, uh, what would it be like, you know, to spend a month with them, uh, uh, not ever met the, meeting them uh, physically? And I thought that that could be a really difficult uh, thing. But what I found over the last year uh, in engagements uh, with various people through our courses uh, is that it's quite, it's quite possible. Uh, it works uh, incredibly well. Uh, that you don't need to travel, uh, that these interactions that are necessary uh, when you're learning uh, with others, uh, you know, works amazing uh, uh, with Zoom and so on. So my experience has been pretty good, both with the conference and, and with the courses that we, uh, that we organize. So um, <clears throat> a lot of this stuff uh, draws upon uh, what we've done in previous um, uh, seminars and so on. And so I've asked uh, Shelta, uh, who's going to be organizing the seminars from now on, to say a few words about uh, how they're going to be organized, and then I'll, I'll carry on with the, the presentation or leading the, the, the conversation as, as we will. Shelta, are you there? Yes. Thanks, Doug. Uh 
as you rightly mentioned, uh, even though this is a very tough times uh, for policymakers uh, who face this uh, heightened uncertainty, it's also a perfect time to uh, start studying these uh, topics uh, in depth and also a very good opportunity these online uh, uh, tools give us uh, so that we are able to meet uh, more frequently than would be possible otherwise. And uh, this is, I think, very uh, good opportunity for us to use. And I hope that uh, we will have very uh, interesting discussions. And about the seminars, uh, uh, the view is that uh, this will be uh, more like a living organism and we will adjust uh, the format as we go, uh, uh, go on and uh, we will see uh, what is the best uh, format that, that suits uh, all of the participating uh, uh, central banks uh, best. Uh, but uh, the idea is that uh, we want to uh, have uh, two types of uh, discussions. One will be more practical, uh, the practical implementation of modeling uh, tricks uh, and uh, how we incorporate several types of issues that we are facing in central banking now into our FPAS models. Uh, and uh, second, we also would like to have more conceptual discussions, uh, which is also uh, important for us to, to have a bigger uh, view, bigger picture of how aware our models may be uh, lacking and uh, what can be added. So this uh, combination of two of technical uh, discussions as well as conceptual discussions, I think uh, is a very good combination uh, for uh, uh, economists like us who are involved in both policymaking as well as uh, modeling. Okay, and, so uh, uh, David, did you want to say a few words or uh, um, I don't see you lit up, but you can jump in at uh, any point um, if you're if you're there. Okay, he might have. Uh, I am here. Can you can you hear me? Yes. There we go. Yeah. Let me just just say a few words about um, the kind of. The, the push of being giving Doug and, and others to have a, a bit more, have a rethink about the way in which we uh, conceptualize the task that we have when doing policy analysis uh, in preparation for policy decision making. When we had a discussion uh, hosted by the Central Bank of Chile, the, a, a key point Pablo made was that the, the biggest remaining issue that we have uh, as practical policy makers is is dealing with uncertainty, treating uncertainty. We haven't really got to grips with that issue um, effectively. And COVID provided a very, very clear illustration, a very clear uh, demonstration of, of the nature of the problem. Um, in the early days of COVID and right through much of COVID, we really had no idea uh, what the outlook was. We, we couldn't put probabilities on things, but we had to think about uh, policy in a what if way. If, what, what if um, the economy stayed shut for, 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 for years at a time? Or what if there was a fast recovery? What would we do in these circumstances? And this is, this is the essence of the shift from Mark 1 to Mark 2, moving into uh, uh, thinking about what, what is the most, not planning, what is the most likely path and what we would do with policy in that most likely path, but rather thinking about what are the range of possibilities that we're confronting and, and thinking around what would we do with policy in those different policy paths. So it's, it's totally forward-looking still. It's totally consistent with, uh, with the use of the tools well, we, we need to perhaps spend more time, and this is what Shelva was talking about, I think, with, with um, sharing the, the tricks of modeling. We need to spend more time thinking about how to uh, model in a forward-looking way some of the what-ifs that are highly non-linear and that we don't meet, uh, we don't expect to meet, but they could be things that we have to consider. So we have to think about how to bring those into our analysis. Just one final point. Um, the, the Fed has um, almost um, officially given up on being forward-looking. Uh, policy is no longer preemptive, says Powell. This is not a good response to dealing with radical uncertainty. Think of a grand chess master. A grand chess master doesn't 
plan a specific path and work out what is the most likely response of the opponent and then what they're going to do along a particular path. A, a, a grandmaster thinks through the whole, a full range of possible uh, ways in which the game is going to play out from here and thinks and strategizes around how to minimize the exposure to what the opponent might do and how to maximize the chances of getting good results along a whole wide range of possible outcomes for the way in which the game plays out. Totally forward looking, but it's no longer forecasting, it's risk analysis, risk assessment, and strategic placement of the um, of, of each move in the forward game. That'll do for me. Okay, so, <clears throat> well, uh, feel free uh, to jump in, and this means everybody. Uh, so this is meant to be, uh, uh, you know, a, a constructive uh, conversation. And so my comments are not meant to be, uh, are not meant to be comprehensive. <laughs> uh, I'm going to touch on uh, a few topics. And the way that I touch on them, because the thing that we advertised was uh, the role of semi-structural models uh, at DSGE models in, in developing uh, this framework is that I will, I will touch upon them uh, based on my experiences uh, as a modeler of DSG or semi-structural models and helping people build models for multilateral surveillance at the IMF or, or helping individual central banks develop uh, frameworks uh, for, doing this, for doing this sort of thing. And I will tell you uh, how I thought about it, uh, how we would present certain things and how we could have presented certain things better, uh, I think, along the lines of uh, what David is has been trying to uh, to push us uh, towards. Uh, I think some of those things were in our minds, but we may have been uh, unsuccessful uh, actually uh, communicating uh, uh, how to do it, uh, and as a result of that, we we we've fallen into some traps. And David is correctly uh, pointing us, uh, I think, in the right direction in this case. So, um, so I use this some of these old uh, in all of my presentations. Uh, it is a quote uh, from uh, Stan Fisher that he used in a speech uh, where he said, "I'd rather have uh, Bob Solo." Uh, than an econometric model, uh, but I'd rather have Bob Solo with an econometric model uh, than without one. Now, I love this quote. Uh, I love this quote uh, for numerous reasons. Uh, it allows me to talk about uh, all kinds of things uh, in a constructive way. Uh, so, for example, uh, if we think of Bob Solo as being a brilliant uh, macroeconomist uh, that was able to synthesize uh, complicated issues and write down simple models that helped us to uh, organize our thoughts. Uh, that that was that was a useful thing. Uh, but it turns out in the design of these uh, frameworks, uh, the first generation of them, what we call econometric uh, models. Uh, so the particular one that uh, that I was uh, involved in uh, was at the Bank of Canada, and it, the model was called uh, RDXF. And so the dream was in the design of that first generation of econometric models is that we would write down some equations and then we'd have these estimation routines that would update the parameters every quarter. Uh, the answer uh, that came out of this after spending person years, I mean, I mean many, many person years of some very bright uh, people in the profession, uh, uh, people external to the bank, as well as uh, drawing on the amazing talent that the Bank of Canada had at the time, was nothing uh, but a complete disaster. So the models uh, fail to have a sensible uh, monetary policy transmission mechanism. Uh, 
And so the very simple uh, test <laughs> uh, when we were using these models was to start asking policy questions with them. And the very first one was uh, in the disinflation in the early 1980s, when we asked how high do interest rates have to go to reduce inflation from tests had uh, followed a procedure that uh, if the T statistic wasn't above two, uh, it did not belong in the equation. That was the methodology that was being employed that back looking uh, style of econometric uh, models at the time. And as a result of that, the effects of interest rates that are consumption function and investment functions, those parameter estimates were way off by about a factor of five. In other words, they were, they were, uh, they were almost zero. <laughs> they, were, they were like 0.2 instead of, you know, like maybe 0.8. As a result of that, when you use the model to ask how high do interest rates have to go to reduce inflation, the answers coming out of the model were ridiculous, uh, much, much higher than what they actually raised interest rates in the early 1980s. And so one of the lessons uh, I think there is that when you're going to spend an enormous amount of resources uh, uh, investing in this in a modeling strategy, that the very first thing that you want to ask is, why am I designing the model? Okay, uh, what kinds of policy experiments am I interested in? Because had they answered, uh, had they had they posed that question, uh, we would have there than what we actually did. But but at the time. Uh, we wanted to estimate a uh, forward-looking model, a uh, model with forward-looking uh, expectations. And at the time, unfortunately, the only thing available was this thing called the uh, Fair-Taylor algorithm. And the problem with the Fair-Taylor algorithm uh, is that because it was... It's a uh, first-order uh, solution which involved uh, lags in the monetary transmission mechanism uh, and nonlinearities. And the combination of those two things, uh, the implication of those two things was that monetary policy had to be forward looking. And that gave rise to the development of inflation forecast based uh, reaction functions, which actually were uh, implemented uh, well before the Taylor rule. So the were reaction functions that, unlike the Taylor rule, had the model's expectations of future inflation in them, okay? And those inflation uh, forecast-based reaction functions uh, usually had leads on inflation. Jose was asking uh, me where these things came from because they, they, they ended up in a lot of uh, central bank models. Why the year-on-year -year inflation rate three quarters into the future? And the reason is that uh, in work understanding model uncertainty at the Bank of Canada that I was doing, investigating all kinds of models, uh, the best uh, reaction function was one that had the year-on-year -year inflation rate, uh, four quarters into the uh, three quarters into the future, and the reason is that a year-on-year -year measure of inflation, uh, three quarters into the future, uh, feeds back a little bit on observable inflation. <laughs> so in other words, the year-on-year, -year, three quarters of the future is the quarterly inflation rate, uh, three quarters of the future, two quarters of the future, one quarter of the future, and now. And the central bank was incredibly good at figuring out the inflation now part, <laughs> okay? So this is a reaction function where uh, you were feeding a little bit on your forecast of inflation, which of course uh, uh, could have a bunch of uh, uh, modeling errors uh, and assumption, you know, problems with assumptions, all kinds of things. But as long as you fed back just a little bit on the actual outcome, that reaction function actually was uh, pretty robust. Uh, well, I'm here to tell you today uh, that it doesn't work work anymore. Uh, that the experiences of global financial crisis, uh, the experiences of COVID. Uh, have clearly shown that things like the Taylor rule and the old inflation forecast-based reaction functions that we use for years just don't do the job. Uh, they're not useful in both a prescriptive sense, which is what we care about when we're policymakers, uh, 
papers. And they work well, uh, obviously, in a positive sense uh, 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 in terms of forecasting, <laughs> uh, because obviously, according to Taylor, for example, uh, if you plug in his estimates of the open gap and the neutral interest rate, uh, we have been departing uh, from the Taylor uh, rule uh, for a very long period of time. And I would say most of those uh, departures, uh, even if you disagree <laughs> with what's been happening recently, I would say most of the departures before a global, the global financial crisis and after, I think were probably good things, okay? So I would want them to be in the systematic component of monetary policy in some sense, okay? I would want, and in fact, uh, work by Ing and uh, Laubach and Reichscheider uh, when they tried to uh, estimate uh, the role of QE on things like bond yields in the economy <clears throat> One of the things that they emphasized was that in 2009, the Fed futures market was rising way too rapidly to be consistent with what would be uh, consistent with a dual mandate central bank. And so you would want to have a framework, according to Ingrid Lobuk and Reichschneider, uh, that showed that we care about high unemployment, uh, you know, unemployment rate that is in the vicinity of double digits. Uh, and as a result of that, we will do whatever it takes uh, to deal with that problem. Now, I'm here today to tell you that uh, that is much, much uh, better handled uh, with an asymmetric loss function. So we could model Fed behavior uh, in a much more sensible way by, by actually just listening to them. And when they say things that we care about maximum of playmate, uh, take them seriously. Uh, because they seem to be behaving in a way where they're waiting uh, the balance of risk in a way where they really care about this uh, full employment. They don't seem to care much about uh, employment going above uh, full employment. So this is a very simple way and, and, uh, and it seems to work quite nicely. In addition, uh, the methodology that uh, we've been using uh, for years uh, is now being uh, formalized uh, in what we call the historical narrative approach uh, doing macroeconomics. Uh, and this, of course, was uh, academically was uh, kickstarted by Romer and Romer uh, in their work on fiscal policy and monetary policy. So uh, the, the remarks that I will make uh, regarding uh, one of the next steps forward in terms of incorporating fiscal uh, will refer right back to uh, a lot of the work that was done uh, looking at this historical narrative approach to uh, to macroeconomics, but David, did you want to say something or, or no? There was I, I thought that okay, good, sorry. Okay, now, but before I do that, <clears throat> I want to talk. I think we're on the verge, actually, of uh, of something really big happening. Okay, like it might be, you know, you've heard about the roaring nineteen uh, twenties. I think we might actually have the uh, the roaring twenty uh, twenties, uh, not necessarily in terms of economic activity, but in terms of the growth uh, in modeling um, that's going to happen uh, over uh, over the next decade. And one aspect of that is going to be uh, uh, deploying uh, open source software, um, and this is going to mean that I think there can be a much better uh, connection uh, between work in academia and, uh, and work in policymaking institutions. But just to give you an idea uh, how, uh, how we can use this, this kind of technology and how we've started to use this technology. So the report I'm gonna be uh, taking you through, uh, we've had uh, almost since the beginning of COVID. Uh, and uh, I would like to think that the design of the report, while it does not have uh, uh, any, uh, any new information, it is organized in a way that is consistent with thinking about uh, uh, causality. Okay, so we've organized uh, the variables that are available on things like our world of data, uh, Google mobility data, Oxford stringency of measures and so on and put them all into one report that we update every day. Okay, so I'm just gonna take you through uh, uh, just some of the data that uh, were updated uh, today uh, by comparing things like uh, daily, uh, the daily fully vaccination rate. Okay, so the accumulated amount of uh, 
people divided by the population. That's critical, divided by the population so that we can make them comparable across countries. Portugal, um, which I live in, uh, we have vaccinated uh, fully uh, over 90% of the population, which is, and I, I'm talking about the total population here. So in the denominator, uh, you have uh, people that are, uh, where they can't get, they, they don't have access to it either because they're old and too frail or they're young people. Uh, and so uh, a fully vaccination rate of over 90% is truly remarkable. Uh, other countries uh, don't have that. It's, it's in Portugal because we have such a, a large uh, tourist sector that everybody knows that we have to be open, okay? That we could only close for so long. And so many come, restaurants, for example, are on the verge of uh, bankruptcy. Uh, they just can't last uh, much longer. Uh, and so as a result of that, it's created this sort of social cohesion that everybody has to pull together and, and kind of save the economy and so on. And so the answer is so far during Omicron, uh, it seems to be working. And so in this particular case, I've, in our report, I've just I've done a little comparison of the United States uh, and Portugal, just to show that uh, the vaccination seem to be working uh, in terms of, at this point, across our rigors, uh, it seemed to be working okay. Okay, so you look at the United States, uh, their fully vaccination rate is only about 60%, a little bit more than 60% of the population. And anyone that's interested in the study of infectious diseases, uh, we also have uh, a little, uh, the, the sort of basic uh, model uh, on my, uh, on our website. Uh, so you can go through and uh, try to understand a little bit about uh, the basic insights of these uh, models that can, that can get quite complicated. But okay, so Portugal, uh, fully vaccinated, over 90%, uh, United States, which is more typical, uh, is only about a uh, little bit more than 60%. You look at new cases, Omicron is hit, uh, it's affecting everybody. It's an incredibly infectious uh, version. Uh, in fact, it's so infectious now that it, it doesn't make any sense to think about uh, uh, the kinds of immunity, the kinds of calculations that we would do for things like threshold immunity and stuff like that. So if the R naught, if you listen to my video, uh, gets up to a number like ten, it means that you have to vaccinate <laughs> everybody. And if there's any problems, and if there's any problems uh, with the efficacy of the vaccines, uh, you effectively uh, you can't you can't really uh, uh, do anything. You have to you have to take care of the problem. Otherwise, it will just uh, get out of control. Now, the key thing in terms of back to the issue of causality, uh, is understanding what happens to the hospitalization rate. Uh, and so if you go back to Portugal, uh, if you look at the right-hand side, the blue thing is uh, the hospitalization rate. And when that number gets up to a number like 0 0.06, seems like a really small number, right? 0 0.06, but uh, 0 0.06 is associated with things like ambulances lining up. Uh, to get to get into the hospital, or even worse, a situation where the infection rate is so high that nobody wants to go around the hospital because they're afraid that if they don't have COVID, they might get COVID. Okay, so there's this critical point where if the hospitalization rate gets above this this critical threshold, that there has to be severe uh, other reactions where social distancing measures are imposed on everybody. Or in some countries, when they when they feel that they can't do that, and it, the disease starts, uh, you know, growing uh, exponentially and looks out of control, the private sector responds uh, voluntarily by doing uh, social distancing and so on. Well, you look at the U.S. Uh, and you see uh, right now with Omicron that the hospitalization rate. Uh, has already gotten up to its uh, previous uh, peak. Uh, the other thing about the report is that we have two measures of economic activity, daily measures. Um, and they are, one of them, uh, my favorite one is retail and recreational mobility. 
And so it's, you know, collecting information from our iPhones about how much time we spend around places that are retail establishments or, or recreational establishments and so on. And you can see uh, that uh, Portugal is holding up uh, a little bit better uh, than, uh, than the US at this point. Now, <clears throat> the other thing in terms of the design of the reports, we've taken a lot of care uh, you'll notice that there's all these vertical lines. Um, and so the, uh, the vertical lines are, are meant to be moving averages, either a 30-day moving average, which you can think of as a monthly number, or a 90-day moving average, which you can think of as uh, a quarterly number. Okay, so the, if you looked at the 30-day moving average at the end of the month, you would have, if you look at that point in the graph, you can see what the, you know, what the monthly observation of that series would approximately be. If you look at the 90 day moving average at the end of the quarter, that would be the quarterly moving average, okay? And so it's just so that when you're looking through, there's 80 countries and there's a one page for each country. And so when you're looking through these things, you can actually just kind of read off the charts, you know, before you get into the data about you know what the re what the results are okay so anyway we do everything in r we do everything in python anything we do in r we do in python anything we do in python we do in r and that's part of the process that the courses that we teach on r and python are designed to be interesting for economists so that when uh, the people come and they take our r and python courses they go home and their bosses are happy that they've got a way to take a course where they're coming back and doing something useful uh, and so on. Now, the subject matter of the discussion today is going to be about the forecasting and policy analysis systems that have been developed uh, over the last, well, again, really starting with New Zealand um, and Can Canada a bit before that. Uh, but it was New Zealand that came up with the term uh, forecasting and policy analysis system, recognizing that this just wasn't a model, okay? This was a process <laughs> for understanding how the economy worked, for thinking about policy in a forward-looking way, and for helping to deal with things like uncertainty. But as David points out, uh, we might have uh, failed in that dimension, or we weren't as successful as we should be. In 2018, before I left the fund, uh, I wrote a book uh, co-edited with Tobias Adrian uh, and Maury Elsell. And this book uh, tried to take stock of our uh, experiences uh, doing technical assistance with central banks, uh, start really starting with New Zealand, uh, helping them to uh, providing advice to them about uh, developing the, this first staff pass. In fact, the first F pass uh, was actually uh, uh, created uh, by some uh, colleagues of mine uh, that had left the Bank of Canada and were helping them to, uh, and were helping uh, New Zealand uh, actually develop this framework there. Now, one chapter of the book, uh, which is what we're going to be talking about today, uh, was called uh, Nuts and Bolts of Forecasting and Policy Analysis System. Uh, work in this area has obviously uh, carried on since 2018. And so some of the things I'm going to talk about are tool set. So everything begins, what an FPAS uh, Mark I uh, central bank is, and what an FPAS Mark II central bank will be. Uh, oh, by the way, uh, one of the things that we're doing uh, is to evaluate uh, the research and writings of central banks. And so one of the classifications that we're doing is, is a central bank an FPAS Mark I central bank or an FPAS uh, Mark II central bank? And this is, uh, this is gonna be quite fascinating how we can use this uh, textual analysis uh, to actually classify uh, central banks on the basis of, of how they write and how they uh, explain things like why they're building one model or, or another model. So what are the three uh, essential uh, in
ingredients of area where we map out the assumptions uh, very clearly and so on. And the three uh, critical ingredients uh, uh, to make this thing, to make our bread in this case, uh, the flour, the water, and the oven, uh, is starting with where is the economy now? And that involves uh, current analysis, now casting. Uh, and we need this, uh, not just the numbers, but we also need, as David points out, the story. Um, so the story, the narrative is very, very important. And that has been emphasized uh, enormously uh, during COVID uh, because <clears throat> when Omicron uh, is about to hit uh, many economies, as we knew uh, not too long ago, and then as we watch it hit uh, all these economies, we have to be prepared for uh, potential narratives where uh, uh, uncertainty could rise and we could go back a little bit uh, towards the situation that we were in in the early stages of COVID. And so uh, not just having nowcasters tell us what the numbers are, but also tell us what the story is, is really important because things are happening uh, so rapidly uh, that we have to stay on top of these things, okay? Now casting also uh, means things like knowing what the output gap is and what the equilibrium real interest rate is, uh, inflation expectations. There's a host of unobservable variables uh, that are a key part, integral part of the uh, analytical framework that, that we also have to, uh, that we have to think about. And then of course, the second part uh, which is what is the underlying uh, driving forces for the economy. So we're just going to think about, we're going to pick two in the United States. One I've already talked about, which is the implications of Omicron or, or maybe some variant that's even worse than Omicron. So that's one possibility. One possibility, uh, let's hope for it, is that somehow uh, COVID gets dumb and uh, it becomes really infectious but has zero virulence or the vaccines end up working uh, really well. So that would be, that'd be great, right? That would be great that, that basically we all get uh, immunity uh, and none of us get really, gets really sick. So all these are, all these things are possibilities. Now, under the possibility that uh, the virus were to get dumb, by the way, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not expecting that, but under the possibility that somehow we claw our ways out of this, we have this issue and that issue is that uh, asset prices uh, have risen by an enormous amount. And if you look at uh, typical consumption functions, which used to fit uh, almost perfectly, you know, with standard errors of like 0 0.2, 0 0.3 in the pre-COVID period, like these are these consumption functions were the best fitting uh, uh, things that we have, uh, as good as the Okun's law relationship, for example. So those consumption functions uh, have shifted enormously as a result of COVID. Now, part of that is uh, there's a bunch of complicated reasons for that, uh, partly because people can't consume what they'd really like to consume. That was very important during the early phases and so on. But the second thing is obviously uncertainty. And we're going to be getting that, getting into that in a course uh, in February uh, with Mr. Uncertainty, uh, uh, Pablo Guerrero, who's going to be leading uh, uh, us through a course on, on what the latest uh, academic uh, uh, achievements have been in terms of implementing, implementing these tools and stuff. So the second important thing is what are the underlying driving forces? And one of the potential driving forces is that it could unleash a tremendous amount of pent up demand in the US economy. Okay, so that's the story for the, you know, for the US if I was just gonna pick two things, but obviously there could be more things on your list than, you know, just two things. And now the uh, defining characteristic. So uh, many central banks uh, will do one and two, but the thing that sets, uh, the FPAS central banks apart from the non-FPAS central banks is that they have an analytical framework that asks, what do my instruments need to do to, uh, to achieve my basic uh, policy objectives? <clears throat> and of course, an implication of that is, what if I don't do that? Uh, how bad 
how bad could things uh, get? Uh, now, the central banks that we worked with uh, over the years developing these FPAS frameworks have been interested very much in this, in this three-prong uh, approach to thinking about uh, policy. Is there someone speaking? Uh, uh, are you doing, uh, maybe it's, uh, we're just not muted, but there's a sound. So if you'd like to speak, uh, I welcome uh, any, okay, maybe it's, it's muted now. Okay, so there's three things. Now, one of the things that we know uh, in the we're in the process of, of documenting uh, is that the central banks that follow this uh, FPAS stuff tend to have much better long-term inflation expectations. And so uh, Carol is showing up here from the Czech National Bank. Uh, the Czech National Bank is a really, really good example of a central bank that is an FPAS uh, Mark I central bank. In fact, uh, some people would even argue that it's an FPAS Mark II central bank. So, but, but everybody would agree uh, that they do the things on this page right now. Whereas other central banks, uh, like the ECB, for example, uh, which have not developed this stuff, which do their forecasts uh, in terms of exogenous interest rates, in other words, interest rates, yeah, I mean, market uh, expectations, uh, those central banks, uh, long-term inflation expectations were ratcheting down uh, with long moving averages of actual inflation. So the longer that inflation stays below uh, your target, uh, obviously, the, the more longer term inflation expectations are going to start adjusting uh, with actual uh, inflation yeah. performance. And so yeah, one of the things that we're about to document uh, is that those central banks, like the Czech National Bank, uh, like New Zealand, like Canada, uh, that have followed this uh, framework for many years that were seasoned uh, inflation forecast targeters, had much better uh, anchored long-term inflation expectations, uh, but more importantly, uh, for those of us uh, that care deeply about unemployment, uh, they are all because long-term inflation expectations were anchored. They also did a much better job uh, managing the short-run output inflation trade-off. Okay, in other words, the, the short-run trade-off between uh, inflation and unemployment. Now. Uh, with uh, COVID, uh, obviously we're experiencing uh, not stagflation yet, but stagflationary shocks um, where, for example, you look at the latest revision of the, of the Fed forecast, you look at the dot plot, uh, inflation has been revised way up uh, and also growth uh, has been revised down and unemployment has been revised up. That's the what I would describe as a stagflationary shock, and those are the kinds of shocks historically, which have which have chat which has challenged uh, even the most seasoned inflation targeting central banks because there are shocks where inflation's high, and you might have to raise interest rates, and it's not you know uh, you know this is this is a difficult thing for this is the things that central bankers do uh, you know. They they would much rather have to, they would much rather to have, to have a shock where unemployment was falling, <laughs> and they had to cut interest rates. Okay, uh, uh, okay. Uh, Jose, do you want to? Uh, say yes. No, I I had just one question that, that I want to know your view in these uh, ingredients for. Um, I know this is for the uh, scenario, but I think like one important uh, ingredient also is the communication what of the and there's several steps of the communication for example if this is uh, what the um, the staff is doing how they communicate that to the board of directors and how the staff communicates to the public so uh, how in this um, in, in this framework that you have here for these ingredients how communication um, what, what is the role of communication in, in, in this in this assessment? Okay, so I ingredients. Okay, so I think that's uh, that's a that's a perfect question. And I think one way to do that, the check case, uh, when you organize your forecast this way, you organize your decision making process this way. Uh, you have to decide uh, what does the staff do. 
and what do the policymakers do? Okay, and so what what do they do at the Czech National Bank? Um, they have some meetings. So first of all, well, this is a point that uh, that uh, David uh, raised, which uh, is very important uh, uh, point to understand. In the central banks that that do it this way. Uh, you don't want to think of uh, the process of doing it, that somehow you just wake up, uh, uh, you know, at the beginning of the month and you decide that you want to construct a forecast and then you want to present it to the monetary policymakers uh, at the end of the month, because in the case of the check case, it takes about a month uh, to produce the forecast. That's the wrong way to think about it. Wrong way to think about it. Uh, the way that David uh, likes to explain this is that it's very much a circular process where there's almost continuous uh, communications between the policymakers uh, and the staff that are uh, producing the, the forecast. Or at least uh, there's communications at uh, very critical points early on. The staff are aware of what the concerns are, the, any new concerns uh, that have been raised since they locked in the previous forecast. So I, I want you to realize that uh, in terms of internal communications, uh, that this process, this way of organizing things, uh, improves uh, internal transparency in the central bank. Uh, and of course, that then becomes a uh, foundation uh, for external communication. Okay, and the way that communications uh, works at the central bank is so simple. Uh, we do it, um, uh, and then we tell people what we did. <laughs> okay, so, yeah, there's no uh, there's no fudging or anything like this. Uh, uh, it's the staff present uh, to the monetary policy committee. They call it a board, and then they document how the board is responding uh, to that forecast and incorporating uh, their views about monetary policy. So I'm going to uh, take you through uh, what the latest forecast is. Um, now, in the each monetary policy report, now it's called a monetary policy report. I've been hounding them for years uh, to change it from an inflation report to a monetary policy report. And, and last year, uh, uh, they finally renamed it as some other central banks are, are starting to rename as well. But this is the one from uh, November. Okay, and the way that this is described to the outside world in every monetary policy report, or what used to be called the inflation report, is that the staff uh, are constructing uh, what they think is the most likely scenario, okay, for the economy, including output inflation and the future policy rate, okay? And that forecast is presented to the monetary policy makers. And the monetary policy makers do not necessarily have to take ownership for that forecast. So just as uh, virtually everybody in this uh, Zoom call right now is unlikely uh, to agree with that point forecast, in other words, uh, the, the black line, I'm sure that we all have, if we did a forecast for the Czech Republic, that our lines or our most likely scenario would probably be all different, okay? And so that's just a recognition that uh, any point forecast has a zero probability of being achieved over the medium term. Might be achieved next quarter, but it's something is going to happen. And what monetary policy is, is not a commitment to any particular line. It's a commitment to adjusting that line in response to new information so that the market is interpreting what the central bank is going to be doing in the future and interest rates, longer term interest rates and variables like the exchange rate then adjust in a much more efficient way, in a way that's consistent with uh, the underlying objectives of the central bank. So that's how it, so that's how it works uh, uh, at the Czech National Bank. Now the policymakers look at that uh, forecast that's presented to them, and it is used as a frame of reference from which they can argue 
maybe that they're more concerned or less concerned about the outlook uh, because of Omicron, okay? Uh, and as a result of that, uh, the discussion can be incredibly rich. Uh, in fact, monetary policy is all about that discussion of the risks. Uh, now, this is unlike, unfortunately, what the Norgas Bank and the Riks Bank have been doing recently. Uh, where somehow the Monetary Policy Committee uh, feels like they have to reach a consensus on that point forecast. Uh, we think that is very problematic. Uh, and you can think about it this way. If it takes a month uh, to create a consistent forecast, uh, what happens if the forecast is locked in and then something happens a day or two before the monetary policy meeting. So obviously it's gonna be impossible for us to change the forecast in a consistent way uh, in response to changing circumstances, okay? And so it, the way the checks uh, do this uh, is very logical. It exploits the strengths of having a well-trained staff that produce, that thinks about uh, the macroeconomics and the economy and how where the economy is, what are the underlying forces, what do we need to do with our instruments, presents that to the monetary policy makers. And what they do is they use it as a frame of reference from which they can describe how their views are different than what's in that forecast. And that is, I think, probably the best way of organizing uh, how we do forecasts or producing scenarios uh, inside central banks. Now, what David would like to see, <laughs> I think, uh, is the staff uh, not talking about um, the most likely scenario, okay? But in some circumstances, talking more about what are the relevant possibilities. And I think right now, uh, based on what I showed you earlier about Omicron, I think you can maybe appreciate some of those comments that uh, the implications of Omicron are incredibly uncertain. And to a policymaker, uh, it might be more interesting to uh, not just see what the staff think uh, the most likely scenario is on a particular day, <laughs> uh, but uh, what they think the most likely uh, or what they think might be some plausible scenarios uh, that could help inform uh, the policymakers. So I think that's that's kind of uh, kind of what the difference is between FPAS Mark II uh, and FPAS Mark I. Now, uh, so Jose, the answer, the very simple answer is that communications gets really simple uh, because the, you're, you're basically uh, just doing it. Uh, you're describing how you do it. And they're just, you're simply just reporting uh, what you did and what you're thinking uh, about. Now, the Czech National Bank takes it a, a step uh, forward in the sense that uh, at, in a certain part of the process, uh, they're, uh, they do try to uh, uh, not argue about things. <laughs> uh, but then uh, after the decisions are made, uh, they also have individual accountability because uh, they actually record and attribute uh, the minutes about what the specific views of the, the policymakers are. Now, you don't have to go that extra step. It might take time uh, to, go, to go that extra step. And there are some issues about, uh, you know, having attribution of minutes about what their views are and, and that sort of thing. But that's, that's how it's done at the Czech National Bank. Um, and I think it provides, a, you know, a very uh, interesting uh, kind of uh, starting place uh, from which other central banks can think about uh, how simple this is. Now, that said, <clears throat> I would caution uh, just a, uh, <laughs> you have to think a little bit about uh, the history and the culture of the countries that have implemented this stuff. And so the Czechs uh, started off uh, with a framework uh, where the staff initially uh, uh, would be providing uh, recommendations to the board, okay? And recommendations then turned into a uh, fully fledged forecast with recommendations, okay? So uh, in some central banks, for example, that don't have that history, uh, 
of the staff uh, providing these recommendations, then it would seem quite natural uh, that they would want to pursue what David is recommending, which is to have the staff uh, present more about relevant possibilities, maybe a couple, you know, uh, and, and allow the policymakers uh, to basically choose the one that they think is uh, most relevant, uh, the one that they think is most relevant for, for telling the story. Okay. Uh, and in fact, that actually happened uh, when uh, they did the FX intervention strategy. Uh, they were presented with two scenarios and, and they, after they implemented the FX intervention strategy, they obviously uh, communicated, uh, you know, what was the alternative scenario because it was the most likely scenario after the policymakers uh, decided about the FX intervention strategy. So, uh, that's an example, I think, uh, that is excellent. Uh, many countries could just follow it precisely, uh, but many countries uh, might uh, prefer uh, to do something uh, that's a little bit more uh, personalized to their specific culture uh, and their historical uh, experience. Jose, did that, uh, was that clear about what the, what the checks do or, or and how important communications and how simple communications can be uh, when you organize it in this way? Yes. Okay, so the story now is uh, going into COVID, uh, the Czechs uh, had been pretty aggressive uh, at ensuring that long-term inflation expectations would not ratchet downwards like they have in the Euro area. And so they went into this uh, a little bit stronger than many central banks. In other words, they had some interest rate space. Okay, so they had gotten inflation up. And as a result of it, they had some interest rate space that they could use, uh, you know, to bring interest rates down again. Okay, so you can see that interest rates on the lower panel were about, about two. Okay, whereas the countries that had not dealt with the problem uh, sufficiently aggressively, their long-term inflation expectations had ratcheted downwards, and obviously they had no interest rate space. That, you know, they were forced to resort right to unconventional uh, policies. Uh, now we've got some inflation, um, and now the Czechs have raised interest rates uh, pretty aggressively. Uh, and as you can see, uh, one of the things they report is the exchange rate. Uh, and in their forecast, they have, uh, you know, uh, also an appreciation in the exchange rate that's sort of consistent with this, the historical trends that the exchange rate in the Czech Republic is, is tends to appreciate over, over time. I'm going to talk a little bit more about that in terms of the use of, now, the Czechs, <clears throat> to go back to the topic of the seminar, started off with a semi-structural model. So a model where you had an output gap equation, had the first principle of monetary policy that is the role of the central bank to adjust the interest rates sufficiently aggressively to anchor long-term inflation expectations. All those insights can be put into a second generation semi-structural model, okay? Now what's missing uh, in, that, in those semi-structural models, models that just involve things like the output gap, for example. So what's missing, lots of things are missing, uh, but one of the mo most important things for the Czech Republic is understanding things like the trends in the real exchange rate. So in the Czech Republic, the real exchange rate uh, since 98, for example, there's been a massive trend appreciation. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about uh, how DSG models were very useful to me so despite the fact that I was uh, uh, teaching them uh, to use a semi-structural model uh, when we first did this, uh, and it was first released in, in 2003, I also built a DSGE model. Uh, it was the first version of the global economy model. And it had all the bells and whistles. So it had a traded goods sector, not traded goods sector. It had a primary uh, uh, goods import, like things like importing car parts and putting cars together and re-exporting them. So it had a tremendous amount of, of uh, detail 
that allowed us to think about uh, trends in exchange rates. Why would the real exchange rate in the Czech Republic uh, appreciate? Um, now, the wonderful thing of those DSGE models uh, is that it allows us to take what I would describe as, uh, as basic DSGE macroeconomics and to put it into action uh, by looking at things like uh, what parameters uh, are influencing uh, how much the exchange rate uh, should be appreciating over time. Now, in the case of the Czech Republic, uh, the story was uh, incredibly simple, uh, both in the real world uh, and in the model. In fact, you might even say it was even simpler in the real world than it was in the model. Uh, so the real world was just a, a wonderful example of of DSGE uh, economics. Uh, so why did the real exchange rate uh, in the Czech Republic uh, appreciate so much? So the answer is this. <clears throat> so to tell that story, um, all you have to understand is the story of the Czech Skoda. And does everybody know what a, what a Czech Skoda is? Um, Czech Skoda is like a car. Uh, and before, uh, the, in the 1990s, for example, when I used to go there, uh, Czech Skoda, uh, you, uh, when we used to drive along the road, we could count the number of Czech Skodas that were broken down. So that was the old Czech Skoda. Okay. Uh, so there wasn't a lot of market, external market for those old uh, Czech Skodas. So like what happened in the automotive industry uh, in Asia, so remember Japan gave the technology to Korea and they started producing cars uh, that weren't quite up to the standards of Japanese automotive makers, they were old technology cars. Virtually the same thing happened in Eastern Europe. Uh, so uh, Skoda's, uh, became uh, old Volkswagens, like great Volkswagens, okay? Really reliable Volkswagens. Uh, new plants were created in the Czech Republic that were, uh, that were the latest technology for building cars and so on. And so the idea at the time that by doing these kinds of things, by bringing in TFP to produce cars cheaper because wages uh, were lower, was that there would be a tremendous uh, amount of potential demand out there uh, from countries, uh, particularly in Europe, but now all over the world, you can see Skoda's all over the world. There's, so there's this tremendous potential demand out there uh, because if you could produce a car, a good car, that was a little bit cheaper than everybody else's car, uh, the elasticity of substitution. So this is what it meant in terms of the DSGE model. So the elasticity of substitution uh, was really, really high. So if you could produce a car cheaper than everybody else, that was a really good car, a car that had a much better reputation than old school is, then the real exchange rate is obviously going to appreciate because the size of that sector is gonna grow. And because of Velasquez-Samos set effects, uh, to be able to get the resources to go from the non-traded sector to the traded sector, uh, we know that the real exchange rate has to appreciate. And so uh, the first uh, stop uh, in, the, in this research on DSGE models that we we're doing at the time was to ask how much of a trend in depreciation can we get out of Blast of Samuelson, uh, where there's a very high elasticity of substitution? And the answer is uh, quite a bit, uh, but not enough. And so the only way to really justify uh, uh, the remaining part of the appreciation was that there was a dramatic uh, increase in the perceived quality of Czech stuff, like Czech Skodas. And so that's a way uh, uh, to say that, look, this is, this is truly uh, a different kind of car. It's a better kind of car you can't think about uh, uh, these cars as being as being the same uh, once the establish once the reputation is established for these new kinds of so that was a that was an example uh, when we were deploying uh, DSGE models uh, to central banks 
where I found <clears throat> working through these models, which effectively, uh, those models, by the way, uh, when I was doing this at the, uh, at the IMF, uh, that work was really inspired by Ken Rogoff uh, becoming the director of the research department. And of course, uh, Rogoff, Obsolt and Rogoff was uh, new open economy uh, macroeconomics. And so our modeling work at the time, uh, which was led by Paulo Pacenti and myself, was all about uh, fleshing out new open economy uh, macroeconomics uh, in a quantitative way. And the first version of that, uh, that global economy model, uh, was the Czech uh, model. Now, in the paper that we looked at, uh, at the time, the application that showed, in, showed up in the, in the Journal of Monetary Economics, uh, we're focused more on policy rules, but uh, most of the work that I was actually doing with that model was trying to understand uh, trends in countries like uh, uh, the Czech exchange rate. Uh, now, other th examples would be understanding things like uh, the Chinese exchange rate. So these DSG models are absolutely vital for thinking about uh, issues like that. Uh, as well as things like terms of trade shocks. Now, the checks have moved on. Um, so the checks uh, went from that semi-structural model uh, to a little DSGE model, which they have now subsequently uh, uh, upgraded as well uh, to include things like uh, oil and so on. Now, uh, I think the lesson there and the, the point I'm going to make uh, about the use of semi-structural models uh, and DSG models, uh, I would have preferred it uh, that they would have retained uh, the semi-structural model. Okay, And the reason for that is that you can see that there's no output gap in my graph. Okay, and I believe that if we're going to implement uh, dual mandate uh, frameworks in central banks, uh, which I believe uh, all central banks are dual mandate central banks, by the way, uh, every central bank that's, that does inflation forecast targeting is a dual mandate central bank in the sense that uh, if they ignored the implication of the short run output inflation trade off, it would result in extreme instability in their economies. So every central bank is a dual mandate central bank. It's only a question of emphasis. So some central banks like the Fed or the Bank of Canada or the Reserve Bank of New Zealand, uh, they express it in a way where it's clear they care about uh, unemployment and full employment and so on. But, ver but all those central banks uh, like the Bank of Canada or the Reserve Bank of New Zealand uh, they were they were practicing this dual mandate stuff well before it was formalized uh, and enshrined in things like uh, the policy agreements uh, with the Ministry of Finance, or in the case of New Zealand, actual central bank law. So they enshrined the dual mandate. So they were doing this stuff uh, already. So every central bank is a dual mandate central bank uh, because failing to do that and acting in a way that's consistent with ignoring the short run open inflation trade-off would result in extreme uh, instability. And so I think uh, we learned that when the checks uh, ran into the effective lower bound. So when the checks ran into the effective lower bound, they used an FX uh, intervention strategy as an unconventional policy instrument. And I think they're going back to your point, Jose, about communications. I think their communication strategy would have been much, much more uh, successful had they said that we're using this to support the economy, okay? Because we care about unemployment, okay? Uh, they would have been much more successful. I'm, I, I'm sure that central bank popularity would have been a lot higher had they gotten the word out uh, that they were trying to do this rather than just uh, raise inflation by depreciating the currency. Okay, so so just depreciating the currency to raise inflation, you know, people might be uh, concerned about uh, the higher inflation, and they might become unpopular as they did uh, as a result of that. So had they got uh, the message out there? Now, there's also some methodological things there as well. 
Um, so one possibility is that you you have two models. <clears throat> and I think that's like the Central Bank of Chile, where you have a DSG model and you have a semi-structural model. For a while, the Bank of Canada, uh, same kind of thing. You have a semi-structural model where you can think about the output gap, and then you have a DSG model because you care about uh, things like the terms of trade. So Canada, commodity exporter, Chile, commodity exporter, uh, you have to you have to have some sort of analytical framework uh, in Chile to think about the price of copper, and in Canada you have to have a framework to think about the price of oil and and other uh, exportables, commodity exportables that they uh, produce, and you can't put that into you don't want to put that into a semi-structural model. You want to draw the line at some point and say, look, uh, this semi-structural models is useful for some things. The most important one being creating, and this is important, a summary statistic to help the central bank communicate how it's managing the short run open inflation trade off. That is quite a bit different than thinking about constructing the output gap to forecast inflation, which is how, unfortunately, many people uh, still think about it to, the, to this day. So, at places like the Bank of Canada, uh, they don't have uh, just one technique that forecasts, that constructs the output gap and tells them how to run monetary policy. They have an incredible amount of work and effort that goes into monitoring the labor market, the product markets. And I think the output gap is thought more as a summary statistic, uh, an imperfect summary statistic. Uh, so the way New Zealand uh, and the Fed does it, is that obviously they do a lot of work in terms of thinking about uh, measures of full employment. And so if they use summary statistics like unemployment, for example, uh, they have a lot, enormous amount of background work that goes into the thinking about how, how they would have to uh, adjust what they think about uh, full employment over time. So the idea, no numerical objectives for full employment uh, it would be an incredibly dangerous thing uh, to set numerical objectives. We learned that uh, from history because in some sense, uh, inflation targeting came from our experiences in the 1970s, which was a period of uh, making monetary policy errors uh, because we didn't know how to deal with supply shocks. Uh, we didn't know how to deal with things like the natural rate of unemployment uh, shifting up. We didn't know how to deal with things like productivity growth, trend productivity growth, uh, declining uh, over time and so on. And so uh, it, would, it would be quite, uh, we shouldn't forget about the lessons about where inflation uh, targeting came from. Unfortunately, in some debates, this has become very uh, confused uh, in some parts of the world. Uh, there are some people that say that inflation targeting, for example, only works uh, when you have situations where you have uh, divine uh, coincidence. Uh, when you have shocks driving the economy that drive, make the economy strong and inflation rise, so it's a no-brainer uh, that you have to raise interest rates. And so this message, unfortunately, has, has been transmitted to certain parts of the world, and they, they are somehow taught that inflation targeting uh, doesn't work uh, if the economy has supply shocks. And nothing uh, could be further from the truth. Uh, inflation targeting was created uh, because of our experiences, uh, because of our uh, the policy errors related uh, for not dealing with uh, supply shocks properly and allowing long-term inflation expectations uh, either to drift uh, upwards or, 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 or downwards in some, in some cases, uh, uh, still have a role to play. Now, I think what what happened uh, in the case of the, the, uh, the Czech uh, National Bank uh, is despite the fact that we, our best efforts uh, uh, were made to tell them, never say the model says, <laughs> uh, uh, to, to always be critical, uh, uh, to always think uh, very much along the lines that uh, David thinks about plausible scenarios and stuff like that. Uh, they did, I think, get into this, this kind of mindset uh, that they had to have one model and kind of one answer. 
Okay. And I don't, the other reason I like having a semi-structural model and a DSG model is that it, it strongly emphasizes that uh, there's a role for both models, that the semi-structural model has some purposes to make the construction of the forecasts easier, embodies some insights for monetary policy, like the, fund, the first principle that you have to adjust your instruments sufficiently aggressively to anchor the system. That can be done very well in a semi-structural model. You could also uh, extend the semi-structural model to include endogenous credibility. So they're easy, they're more malleable and so on. Uh, the DSG model is very useful for helping us to think about how we organize our thoughts about the economy. So the DSG model, if it, if it represents well DSG economics, it's just a story that you have some agents, some consumers, some firms, uh, a government, uh, some foreigners, and these agents are operating in a world where there is both nominal and real rigidities. That's what DSG economics uh, should be all about. And if DSG models are designed in that way to help us think through certain questions, which I think they have been, then that's a perfect use for them. But if you get in this mindset, uh, unfortunately, like the Czechs did, that you have to have one model, okay, that you have to put all your effort into this one model and you choose the DSG model, then you're going to lose stuff like how you measure uh, the output gap, how you think about measuring the output gap and so on. So that's another reason uh, why I like uh, having a semi-structural model because they're easier to work with then they're easy to add things onto it quickly. They're easy to incorporate certain insights. Uh, whereas the DSG model, uh, you know, it's, it, it requires some very highly trained uh, specialists and uh, they're not as adaptable as I think uh, the, uh, as a semi-structural model. So there are certain advantages uh, from having a semi-structural model that, uh, now I think the problem that uh, uh, the Czechs had uh, kind of fell into this trap that the model says, uh, which kind of leads you to this model is better than that model. And I think what happened is that they just forgot to update the semi-structural model <laughs> It became something that that the model says, and since the model was not uh, uh, updated over time, it kind of it kind of became the bad model. Whereas if all the work went into the DSG model, it became uh, the good model. And I don't think that's the the right way. Yeah. Uh, to think about models uh, because that seems like a natural point uh, for people to uh, chip in. Uh, what's the best approach? Uh, should we just have a semi-structural model? I would say no, because we would be missing uh, the DSG economics. Should we just have a DSG model? Well, I've said no, because we lose the output gap. Now, I, I guess I should have indicated that in DSG models, we could calculate things like the flex price output gap and so on, right? But I'm assuming that uh, in this audience, uh, many people would have done that or at least looked at the results of flex price output gaps and clearly uh, concluded that those things are not ready for real time, prime time policy analysis that that they're just, they look like they're just full of measurement errors and, and very extreme assumptions uh, that go into the construction about the specific details of the DSG model that, that obviously are, are, uh, are, are nonsense. Uh, and so I think uh, there's another approach uh, uh, that is possible rather than have two models uh, where you kind of nest it uh, into one model uh, where you sort of treat the DSG model. So this is one approach. Kind of treat the DSG model as um, typically uh, think about uh, measuring it. So there's, there's different ways of doing this. My preference to have a uh, 
model is G model. And more importantly, having open to a situation where structural model or consistent with each other, or at least to identify. I think if you have different modeling groups uh, building those two models, well, first of all, I think you need the DSG people to, to help us map out the structure of semi-structural models. And I think we're doing work on semi-structural models helps us uh, to think more about the quants and the dynamics that we incorporate into DSG models and to obviously know what the limitations of those models are. Uh, namely, the expectational channels are, are probably way too strong, again, to use those models for prime time. But I think that's a, that might be a good place to, to have a, a bit of discussion uh, of, of semi-structural models, DSG models, uh, what is the best thing uh, uh, to do? Jose, you're in, oh, Mike, Michael Kiley from the Fed. Michael, go ahead. Hi, hey Doug, um, how are you? Um, sorry, I don't have my camera on everybody, but I, uh, my technology, first I wanna ask if you can hear me because I'm using an unusual computer um, and I'm worried the microphone may not be very good. Uh, we can make you out, you're, you're audible, but I, I appreciate that you're going slow because you're, you're not coming through loud and clear, but we can hear you. Okay, may, maybe this is a little bit better. You know, I just wanted to, I, I, on your last couple of points, Doug, I very much agreed with your general discussion about multiple models and in particular, the virtues of semi-structural models, um, complementing DSG models, that going all in on a DSG approach is not obviously the best way, in particular with relationship to output gap estimation. All that said, uh, you know, I do think that um, there are ingredients in DSG models that bring a flexible price concept of the output gap, you know, pretty close to what might come out of a, of a different approach where one is doing smoothing and, and detrending and things. And it's a, it's a question of what sort of structural shocks one thinks are plausible you know, and how those transmit, you know, and so for example, I have a research paper on that, but that, that's mm -hmm. not particularly important. Um, I think that points to two things, right? One is it could point to one thing that you said, which is bringing the models together um, and trying to have the semi-structural approach and the DSGE approaches inform each other, which is another thing that I very much agree with. The one caveat to that, which I, think is implied in what you said, but I've seen in, in model developments at the Fed and in other places is the danger is when you bring those things together, there is this tendency and it reflects both resource constraints. And I saw a comment in the chat, you know, that those are really important, how many economists you have and their level of expertise. And it also reflects an inherent tendency for people to like one story, even though they should like many stories because we're very uncertain about what the right story is. When you bring the models together, there is this tendency to try to create one model. And again, I, I think it is multiple models if you, can, if you can afford them are a very good thing. Uh, yeah, I think uh, I, those are wonderful comments, Michael. And I'm sure that with enough effort, people like you uh, could construct a uh, flex price uh, output gap, <laughs> okay? Like by making the assumptions in a DSD model uh, more plausible, okay? And, I, and that's totally okay. Uh, but, but the question is, uh, is it easier? Uh, uh, in other words, for most central banks that aren't the Fed, <clears throat> is it easier? Are they likely to make less errors uh, also using uh, semi-structural models. So I, I, I don't have a general uh, answer to that. Uh, the answer is uh, maybe some will, maybe some won't. Uh, but I appreciate uh, all those uh, comments. Uh, I think they're great. Uh, does anybody have any <clears throat> reactions to what Michael said or, or have any uh, additional comments?
There was one thing that Michael said, which I thought was particularly um, appealing, and that is that um, we should not, we should resist the urge to try and find the best story, the most appealing story, the story that uh, we're going to run and defend in favour of trying to think through the, the range of plausible stories that we could be confronted with when we get out of bed tomorrow and realise that things are very different. I wonder whether whether if um, this would be helped by a shift in the um, relationship between decision boards and staff doing an, an analysis. If decision boards end up saying, we want, here, here's the three or four or whatever things that we're worried about could happen. Tell us what we would need to do in those circumstances. That would shift the dynamic, shift the focus very much away from competition for the best story to mm -hmm. how do we answer the board's questions? Maybe it's a bit of a cultural shift to achieve that, but it would be a, a nice way of going. I, I was surprised, uh, David, uh, given your experiences at uh, the Reserve Bank of uh, New Zealand. Um, so Michael, like at the Fed, you have tons of resources, right? So, uh, so obviously you could have a core bottle <laughs> and then you could have, uh, you could have other core bottles like each Apple of C Weber could have a core bottle, right? Uh, and, and you could afford that. Uh, in places uh, uh, like New Zealand that just have a handful of staff uh, doing this kind of thing, uh, the system is subject to the criticism that you're talking about, right? That, uh, that you, there might be too much focus on, uh, on one particular thing. There's lots of uncertainty. So what do people do? They focus on, on one thing, okay? Uh, and one of the things that they did in New Zealand, which I thought was uh, very novel, uh, is that they would choose someone uh, to critique the forecast. <laughs> so in other words, so the, somebody would, so a bunch of people would produce the forecast and then they would ask someone uh, specifically uh, to critique it, uh, to take a, you know, a critical look uh, to make sure, that, and, and I think uh, this was done under Governor Brash, or David, or maybe, can you fill us into the, the, maybe the details about this? Um, yeah, I think what you're talking about is an exercise. Pressure in your we, mind about who, what actually. Yeah. Uh, the, the exercise you're talking about was one that, uh, that we initiated to try and um, pull people away from uh, false precision about the outlook. Uh, so the, the, um, the approach we took was to pick a couple of relatively fresh graduate recruits, people who uh, were not already kind of bound into the, 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 the thought ideology of the place or the standard way of thinking about things, not part of the forecasting team, and specifically ask them, uh, one, to uh, produce a, um, a, a scenario that would be plausible and consistent with the current data, but would result in very much higher interest rates than the central track that the forecasters were coming up with. They would have to tell a story as to how um, this might come about, but given that history had plenty of ex examples where interest rates turned out to be much higher than anybody had been predicting, that shouldn't be too much of a problem. Likewise, the, another person, the other person would be asked to produce a scenario where interest rates would turn out to be very much lower in the future than uh, the central track was, was generating. Again, had to be consistent with the current data that we were observing, could not be just a, 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 um, a, a meteor strike or a COVID strike something of that nature pulled out of the blue. It had to be something which was embedded in the dynamics of the economy. But again, we have seen many occasions in history where interest rates turned out to have to go a lot lower than we expected. And all the dynamics were already present when we made the wrong forecast. 
so it shouldn't have been too much of a difficulty to come up with these alternative uh, tracks. Frankly, it didn't work. Uh, people found themselves um, without being directed to think through a particular scenario. Let's say a scenario in which an inflation expectation suddenly wake up, ratchet upwards, or let's say it's a, a world in which we have uh, the next variant of COVID come along, and not only is it virulent, but it's also particularly uh, dangerous. Unless given a story like that to work through, people seem to find it quite difficult to construct their own stories, which is a human dynamic, I guess, we have to think about them when we, when we organize this business. But it, it seems to me that if you're organized where you have a committee, um, like if you had the resources, then if each member, um, you know, had the resources to, to do all this stuff, um, uh, so then it would come down to, uh, you know, what the rules of engagement were. Um, so I, you know, it, it, when you're a really small institution like uh, the Reserve Bank of New Zealand, I can see how there could be practical problems. But you think, like, if you didn't have more resources, uh, you don't think that you could, you could have competing forecast teams and competing models? Yeah, I don't. I don't think the idea is to set up a competition because it's the. It, it, we know that um, uh, it's the the person who sounds the best wins those competitions rather than the person with the truth. There is not actually a truth here, but you, you get the point that I'm making. Training training people to recognise that they don't know the future. And so they should learn to be able to think through alternative possibilities and work out what, what would be a smart policy response consistent with uh, the policy objectives we've got in these different worlds. Training people to think along those lines is very different from setting up competing teams. Now, uh, over time, um, even a very small team could probably build up a, uh, a library of types of shocks, types of shifts in, in, in model dynamics, um, model surprises that would allow them to be able to respond to the policymaker's question. I'm now worried about this. I heard a story from somebody from listening to some academic at a conference or listening to another central banker talk about a problem. Mm -hmm. I'm now worried about it. Please tell me if we face those circumstances, what I would need to be doing. Over time, there would be a library of such um, experiments, thought experiments built up to be sure a small central bank with limited resources would take a lot longer to build that up than a central bank that could uh, put different teams of economists on to working these problems out. But over time, I think it would, it would work. Okay, so thanks, uh, David and, and, uh, and Mike, um, for those interventions. Uh, I wanted to move on to uh, what we think uh, uh, are going to be interesting uh, model enhancements uh, uh, to be consistent with this FPAS Mark II uh, approach to doing things. And, and of course, uh, uh, what, is, uh, what is interesting for uh, our key policy issues that, that we're facing right now. So it would great, be great to get, uh, to get Mike's view about this stuff too. But uh, one aspect of this, um, if we think about what's new in FPAS, uh, David's already emphasized is more emphasis on studying the policy implications of uncertainty and avoiding dark corners. Um, I like to add one uh, much better delineation of views uh, about the economy and policy objectives. And I'm going to, to talk about uh, some of our work uh, just briefly on endogenous policy credibility, where it makes much more sense in those models to think of an objective function for monetary policy so that if the structure of the economy is evolving because inflation credibility is changing over time, uh, that the interest rate path 
reflects how the economy is changing over time. Um, and so uh, I think that uh, th uh, that is important. And uh, the work that I've been doing uh, over the last year uh, with my students, <laughs> we found that it's just much easier to characterize Fed policy as a mixed complementarity problem. And I'm gonna explain exactly what I mean by that. And the techniques that we have at our disposal uh, to be able to do that in things like uh, Dunair and Iris uh, allows us to do that really easily. Now, people at the Fed uh, used to do this stuff. Uh, and, and in fact, they even took the Furbis and, and people like Bob Tetlow and, and, and created a, a stripped out version where you can do things like optimal control. And that's effectively uh, what we're doing here. But so I wanna, I wanna spend a little time uh, talking about uh, this mixed complementarity problems and try to convince you that virtually every interesting problem, every interesting policy problem uh, is a mixed complementarity problem. Uh, but before I do that, then I, let me talk just a little bit about the other things that are, that are sort of on the wish list. So obviously uh, financial accelerators, we have to have financial accelerators in all of our models. Uh, uh, it'd be preferable uh, if they were not linear, uh, like in our work on MapMod, uh, where we use them to study macro prudential uh, policies and so on. Uh, but also for looking at things like uh, unconventional policies. Uh, and the ones that we talk about in our courses are things like yield curve control or FX intervention strategies like uh, the Czech National Bank uh, employed. But a lot of this work uh, that we're doing on nonlinearities uh, are creating results that are causing us to rethink uh, how we thought about the benefits of policy coordination. And I'm talking about not just uh, coordination about uh, monetary fiscal policy, but also international policy coordination in terms of dealing with shocks that have uh, global and large cross-country uh, spillover effects on things like exchange rates and so on. Uh, and then of course, uh, lastly, I already hinted at this, is open source software. Uh, so I just gave you a, a brief glimpse uh, at how we use it for surveillance, uh, for monitoring COVID and so on. Uh, but we are uh, very close uh, to developing uh, front ends and open source software that will replace uh, all the software that we currently uh, buy uh, uh, from, uh, from vendors and so on. And the development of this open source software uh, is going to mean that people in academia uh, are going to be using similar kinds of tools that are going to be available in policymaking institutions. So that marriage between uh, research in academia and policymaking institutions uh, might become stronger over time as we reduce the cost of entry uh, into this thing. But even more recently, uh, because we're interested in, in improving economic and financial literacy, uh, this should not just be a uh, subject matter that is uh, in the realm of central bank geeks. Uh, other people should have access to it. So if you look the history of macro modeling, while central banks have effectively abandoned, almost all central banks have abandoned those old style uh, reduced form econometric uh, models, uh, they are still used widely in the private sector. Uh, they're used in commercial banks. Uh, they're an important part of our regulatory framework. And they are 30, 40 years behind uh, the times. And so the development of open source software is going to open up the possibilities uh, for doing things and getting exposure uh, to things that most people uh, wouldn't, uh, you know, the costs of, of entry are, are just too uh, high uh, for some uh, private sector institutions, or they simply are not aware of all the wonderful developments that have happened. Uh, and the last thing, uh, is training programs uh, for professional uh, economists. And, and to think about those things, uh, we call them uh, TCCP, uh, training, coaching, and collaboration. And so they've been designed by talking to uh, people, uh, Michael, of our age, <laughs> and asking them 
Uh, what would have been nice, what kind of training would have been nice after you uh, arrived from grad school uh, to help you prepare better uh, for dealing with uh, people like David uh, and the kinds of questions that, that people uh, like David ask. And so uh, I think that's some of the things. Uh, now, I want to talk a little bit about uh, uh, what uh, mixed complementarity problems are. Um, most people, uh, many people that even do uh, mixed complementarity problems uh, uh, do not describe them this way. Uh, uh, I, I particularly like uh, the way that these things are uh, described, and I think we should be using uh, this term, uh, mixed complementarity problem. But a mixed complementarity problem <clears throat> is, is starting off with an objective function uh, uh, for a monetary policy. Uh, in the one that I'm going to be looking at uh, to model Fed behavior, uh, it's going to be a quadratic uh, objective function that's asymmetric uh, in the sense that uh, we're going to assume that the Fed cares about uh, squared uh, negative output gaps, okay, but they don't care about squared uh, positive output gaps, okay. And, and I want you to, I mean, there's two ways of, of thinking about, of, about the use of these mixed complementarity problems. Uh, one way is in the design of robust policies, okay, which means that uh, we'd have to think about going through this exercise under model uncertainty and all kinds of things, and then asking uh, uh, what would be the, the best strategy for dealing with uncertainty. So that's one way of doing it. Uh, the fact that the loss function is asymmetric, uh, where you only care about uh, full employment, uh, it, it raises some uh, conceptual issues uh, about uh, time consistency and so on, uh, whether or not there would be an inherent uh, kind of inflation bias uh, that, would, that would develop. And, and I, I don't think those problems are insurmountable, but that's one way of thinking about using the tool. That is not the way that I'm going to be uh, thinking about the tool here. I'm going to be thinking about the tool simply as a better way of drawing the path for the Fed funds rate uh, than uh, conventional Taylor rules, linear Taylor rules. Okay, uh, and of course, uh, how that uh, policy rate path uh, is constructed is also going to depend on the view about the economy. And so in the mixed complementarity problem, uh, when I optimize this uh, objective function, I'm going to have a bunch of equations for the economy and that those equations can incorporate things like uh, linear equations uh, and they can also incorporate nonlinear equations. So the particular ones that we've been, in, that we've been uh, playing around with over the last year, are things like convexity in the Phillips curve to pick up the idea that there could be uh, capacity constraints, things that you read about in the, in the newspaper uh, uh, almost every day. Uh, but in addition to that, uh, for a lot of countries uh, where long-term inflation expectations are, are much more uh, fragile, uh, the types of shocks that we're facing right now because they're, they're stagflationary shocks. Those are the kinds of shocks that really pose uh, challenges to monetary policy in a lot of these countries that have uh, fragile uh, inflation expectations. Uh, and then lastly, uh, and maybe uh, <laughs> I wanna say that each one of these things is equally important, <laughs> uh, that you have to have the whole package together. <laughs> <laughs> to understand what the insights are. You can't have one, you can't have quadratic objective function with a linear economy. We're back in the old uh, silly world, okay? And so we have to have a, some non-linearities in the economy to make the problem uh, interesting, okay? And so what is that uh, non-linearity? Uh, well, it's the effect of uh, lower bound uh, on interest rates uh, and the insight uh, from these mixed complementarity problems is that you better be ready uh, with some alternative instruments uh, to step in and, and replace the policy space that's been lost 
by hitting the effective lower bound. Because if you don't, there is a potential uh, fragility for long-term inflation expectations to ratchet downwards. Okay, so that's 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 one of the risks that you end up being like the ECB or the Bank of Japan, where where your neutral where your interest rate uh, in all situations is lower than what it is on average in places like the Czech Republic, where they don't allow long-term inflation expectations to drift down. But more importantly, um, that asset prices start acting as shock amplifiers in the system. And we saw we see that clearly, and that's been documented in our work uh, in countries like Japan. Uh, so in Japan, uh, during the global financial crisis, uh, this is a story going back to uh, Canada. So the global financial crisis center was in the United States. Uh, Canada, which has very, very strong trade linkages to the United States, did not have a problem in its financial sector. Uh, things worked uh, as uh, expected uh, and as uh, what we would like them to do, in the sense that uh, when the global financial crisis hit, uh, people in markets revised down the expected path of the real interest rate, and that made the Canadian dollar depreciate. The exact opposite happened in Japan. And so because Japan was at the effective lower bound on interest rates and because they did not have um, the perception that other instruments were going to step in and to fill that policy space, you started to observe behavior where the Japanese yen acted like a very important shock amplifier in the system. So in 2009, for example, it appreciated by uh, over 20%, resulting in a massive contraction in not only exports, and then, of course, the higher real interest rate and effects of this contraction in external demand uh, resulted in a massive collapse in uh, domestic demand. And so if you look at the output caps uh, that we measure for Japan and Canada, uh, they were twice as big in 2009 in Japan than they were in Canada. And you might say uh, <laughs> uh, Canada uh, was also a commodity exporter. And so as a result of that, the halving in commodity prices, not only did they face a massive negative external demand shock, but they also faced a massive uh, negative terms of trade shock. Japan, which is a commodity importer, it faced a positive terms of trade shock in the sense that the cost of its inputs uh, got much cheaper with the decline in things like uh, oil prices and so on. And so that is, an, that is an example where when you get into one of these low inflation traps, uh, not only do you have less policy space on average by not taking decisive action to get out of it, uh, but you can end up in a situation where uh, when bad things happen, demand falls, for example, uh, you can get into a situation where re where people revise down inflation expectations and real interest rates rise and the exchange rate can act as a very important shock amplifier in the system. Okay. And so anyway, we've been uh, extending these models for those of you that are interested in uh, exchange rates. Uh, we've been extending these models with endogenous credibility and the effective lower bound and alternative uh, policy strategies. Uh, and finding that, uh, interestingly, uh, we can explain most of the depreciation in the U.S. dollar, the 10% depreciation that occurred Hello. last year, by what simply on this? highly expansionary policies in the U.S., fiscal uh, policies, yeah. Yeah. with a highly accommodative yeah. monetary yeah. policy yeah. that was designed to uh, yeah. increase the expected price level in the U.S. in other words, to yes. generate yes. overshooting yes. and uh, yes. and when you have a country yes. like yes. that uh, doing that, that's going to be consistent yes. with a big depreciation in the dollar uh, and as well an unwelcome appreciation yes. in those institutions or in those countries uh, that would really uh, like to stimulate as well 
Bueno, pues eso es el crédito hipotecario más grande. Llegando a la pasada. They're driving the real interest rate down and inflation expectations up. And so the normal mechanisms in our in our standard arbitrage conditions or risk adjusted UIP conditions. Uh, uh, so, you know, provide these one with this uh, loss minimization approach to get this idea that uh, uh, that it's, you know, that it's a good thing to try to overshoot. And so the countries that are planning to overshoot, they fall behind. And, uh, real interest rates are sufficiently low, and as a result, they get uh, this appreciation uh, in the currency that's uh, that's unwelcome. And so that's, I, I think, uh, a very uh, interesting uh, application uh, that that many people uh, will be uh, will be interested in. Now, it should not be uh, surprising. Um, once you understand uh, what a mixed complementarity problem is uh, in terms of thinking about this as an objective function for policy, in terms of thinking of a collection of linear and nonlinear equations, again, where you can investigate uncertainty in the structure of the Phillips curves and uncertainty about credibility and inflation expectations and everything else, that combined with this uh, occasionally binding constraint, the effect of lower bound on interest rates. It should not be surprising uh, that the policy solutions to that, uh, finding the instruments uh, to replace the policy space that's been lost by the, hitting the effect of lower bound is also a mixed complementarity problem. Uh, hitting the effect of Lord Bow, dividing some other instrument. Well, that other instrument is going to turn on uh, when policy is constrained by the effect of Lord Bow. And so it is also an occasionally binding constraint. And we have uh, two uh, approaches uh, to that problem um, in terms of thinking about that uh, formally. Uh, after we show you that you could compute much better paths for the policy rate than things like a, a standard uh, Taylor rule or inflation forecast based reaction function that, that I was referring to right at the very uh, beginning of the talk, you could then talk about alternative policies. Uh, and the ones that we talk about in our courses are uh, using the Czech Republic, which uh, employed an incredibly successful FX intervention strategy uh, to deal with the effect of lower bound on interest rates and to escape uh, low inflation traps. So as I say, uh, they also have the effect of lower bound. Uh, they used an exchange rate floor. Um, and the way that they used the exchange rate floor was very much uh, consistent with the principles uh, that we apply in monetary policy formulation. Uh, even during uh, normal normal times, okay? They thought about the exchange rate floor as a instrument and not a target. Uh, and we show that when you do that uh, and you do it in a way that's consistent, designed to be uh, something that's consistent with what your inflation and output uh, objectives are, that you can actually do this uh, with actually few uh, interventions uh, that the policy can be uh, uh, super credible uh, if it's designed uh, appropriately. Uh, we also consider the uh, possibility of using yield curve control or more precisely uh, yield curve caps. Uh, and that is uh, actually potentially more problematic, uh, but one that can be uh, thought of uh, and assessed uh, as a mixed complement uh, complementarity problem. Okay, so uh, if you go back, uh, you're wondering about the details of this. You might want to go back a, a, a couple of months where we have a seminar where where we actually work through uh, some very simple uh, scenarios uh, uh, about things that <coughs> people in the Fed could be worried about. So think about uh, downside scenario where Omicron or Omicron plus uh, uh, results in a situation where we return back to 
a massive level of uncertainty. Okay, so something really bad. Okay, so that's one possibility. Another possibility is that things work out uh, for the economy. And given these latent uh, demand pressures, uh, we end up uh, moving into a world where there's massive excess demand and, and the potential for inflation expectations to rise. So it's a question of balancing uh, what those two, uh, those two risks are and how policymakers, policymakers get to choose uh, how those two things are balanced. What our job is as economists is to provide them with a set of tools that allow them to do that uh, more uh, effectively. Uh, so uh, that's uh, all I have to say uh, about mixed complementarity problems, which I think are a very uh, important tool uh, that we need to put in our toolkit. Uh, now I realize, uh, Mike, if you're still there, uh, that many of these things uh, you've been doing uh, at the Fed uh, for years now. And so you might think of uh, what we're doing here is trying to, uh, to make them practical for uh, other, other central banks to, to, to do in, uh, you know, when they have far less uh, resources and so on. Uh, so anyway, I think uh, I, I, uh, I will leave my discussion of of mixed complementarity problems there. Uh, and I, if there are no questions or comments about that, um, I think we'll probably leave um, the other items uh, for future seminars. One of the things I wanna talk about uh, is also uses the, uh, this idea of mixed, but in this case, so instead of mixed complementarity problems, uh, we're talking about mixed frequency modeling systems where we formalize uh, effectively taking high frequency data or forecasts based on high frequency data and combining them or blending them with the forecasts uh, from other semi-structural models or our DSG models. Now that idea um, uh, will hopefully uh, eliminate uh, some of the gap between theory uh, and practice in many institutions uh, by allowing us to, uh, to formalize uh, that process a bit. But in addition to that, uh, it also, it also uh, opens up the possibility uh, when, we, when we think about doing that, so that stuff, about building models uh, that are simple enough, uh, but yet rich enough uh, that people in the private sector uh, can actually use. And so we're going to have a, a session uh, about uh, how to uh, kind of uh, uh, de geekify <laughs> uh, a lot of this complexity that we do uh, because we're central bank modelers uh, and try to make it more accessible uh, to people in institutions where they have far less resources uh, for doing these kinds of things. But I will leave that until, uh, until future seminars. And at this point, uh, if there are any comments, uh, I think we're just a little bit above uh, the, the time limit here. Um, but if there are no comments, I think uh, I will adjourn. But does anybody want to have any, any last questions? And final words for today, or, or, I see that Shelva has arrived, and we have Yorgi, who's done the work on on thinking about uh, exchange rates and so on. So we'll leave that for uh, for uh, for a future seminar, perhaps. Okay. Um, David, do thanks, you Doug. I've got to run too. So um, it, was, it was a great, uh, great session. Thank you very much. Okay, good. Thank you very. Thank you. Thank you, David. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, Jose. Uh, thank you, Shelva, for uh, for your participation today. Okay. Thank you very much, and hope to see you uh, in two weeks. See you guys. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.